Dominic Mann runs Mentor Cruise, a bootstrapped software platform that connects eager people with, you guessed it, mentors. Now, as someone who has tried and failed to build a marketplace before, I really wanted to know how Dom did it. We'll talk about how hard it really is to bootstrap two audiences at the same time, how to deal with payments, taxes, that kind of stuff, and most importantly, how to handle a business that revolves around people. Dominic is a very thoughtful founder, and you'll learn a lot about approaching building a calm but quite profitable business here today. This episode is sponsored by Acquire.com. More about that later. Now, here is Dominic. Dominic, welcome to the show. I'm a big fan of Mentor Cruise, and that's a platform that I have used already to mentor software founders in the past. It's really cool. It's a great software business itself to, to dive into. I'm gonna, we're going to do that during a conversation. And it's a big catalyst for learning. So it's right down my alley. So let's let's talk about mentorship for a little bit. In terms of the dynamics of mentorship, can you share with me uh, a myth about digital mentoring, mentoring virtually or online that Mentor Cruise has successfully debunked? Yeah, there's been this persistent myth that I would encounter usually in the beginning stages of Mentor Cruise that uh, would usually say virtual and then also paid mentorship just can't work out. Because mentorship is this like highly personal thing where you reach out to a trusted person in your circles, uh, maybe someone that you've worked with for years, or maybe someone that works at a university and so on. And the same magic can't be uh, encountered just like picking someone online, paying for them and having a relationship that way. Um, I think after like 12,000 mentorships where we helped a ton of people like start new businesses and, and get into new jobs and move countries and whatever, uh, we've probably debunked that. Um, but yeah, in those first few weeks uh, or first few months when I was reaching out to mentors, no credibility at all, that was a thing that I've heard quite quite often. That's a, that's an interesting one. It's also that that was one of the thoughts that I had when I went to the platform. Like, how is this going to work? Like, how can I trust? And that, I think that is the central word, right? Trust that the platform is right for me, that the people that come to the platform trust me. I think that that's a big issue. Trust, trust building and trust retention, right? Though that seems to be a, a central part of this. Have you, have you ever dealt with fraud? Like, is there a lot of fraud? Because where there's money, people try to cheat. How, how is that happening for that platform? You know, I wouldn't say fraud is first rampant. Maybe we're a too small platform for for that to have encountered a lot. But I mean, definitely it happens, uh, especially now when we, you know, get into the space of AI and ChatGPT, it's actually becoming more frequent where, you know, you just encounter like applications that seem like very much GPT written uh, and you, you try to background check and there's not an actual real person behind it. Um, that has always been a, a thing. Maybe people that lie a little bit about their jobs um, and, you know, maybe that, that don't tell that whole truth. Um, but now, especially with AI, you know, sometimes we get almost a little bit of a, like an attack vector where people try to uh, get, a, get into the platform somehow with a fake profile. I mean, fortunately, we've been around long enough that we have systems that catch that. You know, you, you need to come to Mentor Cruise. You need to essentially do a, a KYC verification, which is you need to submit an ID through Stripe and so on. So we know who these people are. We know where they live. We know that they have an ID somewhere. Um, and so th there is a certain source of trust there. And we also review the profiles. We talk to the people. We make sure that Hopefully 99 plus percent of people on the platform are real people and really are what they say they are. Um, so we're lucky in that regards. But yeah, it's been getting more common, definitely. That's, that sounds like a lot of work on your side and, and not like a typical SaaS business in terms of just, you know, you have it running somewhere and you're sitting on a beach. <laughs> now that kind yeah. of life. So <laughs> there, there's a lot of manual labor just in, in validating and, and verifying people. Am, am I getting this right? How, how many people are working on this right now? Um, so we're five people. Um, I would say roughly me and then two other people in what I would call operations, which is just like leaving the, the thing running. Um, and yeah, definitely. I mean, a marketplace is a, a different game, especially the, the way that we are doing it, which you would call a vetted marketplace, which means that, you know, you kind of have to go through us to, to be on the marketplace in the first place. Um, and so there's, there's a bit of manual labor involved as well. Um, what's also makes, makes it interesting. Like our product is very slim. What maybe a SaaS founder can say, I think they're, you know, building a lot on their, their, uh, software. They maybe need to hire a dev as kind of their first hire. That's not the case for us. It's definitely more of a people business. And so, you know, the most hires that we do are operations people, customer support, community management, that kind of stuff. 
It's it's funny when I think about SaaS businesses, I think about like people building features, features, features. It feels like for you, you have a, a certain kind of scope of what you need to offer, and the features are actually people that come onto the platform to teach, right? New wonderful mentors, that's a new feature. You don't need to implement a new software feature if you can attract more talent to uh, to come to the platform. That brings me to I think one of the 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 biggest questions that that anybody has about like marketplaces, like marketplaces are hard mode. That's what it feels like to me. Building a marketplace, bootstrapping, and like bootstrapping in in two ways, right? Bootstrapping financially and bootstrapping from nothing, a two-sided marketplace. That feels like it's the hardest way to build a business. How did you do that? How did you get the vetted marketplace going where you had both high quality mentors and students that would actually stick with those mentors? Yeah, I mean, I think marketplaces are a different game than SaaS. Um, maybe you could call it harder, but I think that really highly depends on, on who you are as a founder as well. Um, because, you know, if you are, I would say, the typical bootstrapper or indie hacker, you probably have like a software background and or maybe a design background. But the thing that you do really well is building a software product. That's kind of what you do. Uh, and so it's it's very natural to say, you know, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to build a software product. This is what I do well. And then I just need to kind of sell it and market it somehow. And, and that's it. Um, marketplace are a people business. So this is kind of the the background that you need to have to, to build a business like that, um, which also means it's actually a really great business if you don't have that software and design background if you have some sort of kind of leverage or maybe a community behind you marketplace are a wonderful business because you you don't need to build a ton of features you just need to build out the people and if you already have the people somehow that makes it a lot easier and that was the situation for me as well um, i had a kind of uncommon background coming into tech i did a lot of self-teaching self-studying um, i was embedded in all those community which you know you know uh, what to speak of there um, I was embedded in all those self-learning communities that were just hungry and longing for mentorship. And so I kind of already had one of the sites or at least access to one of the sites. And so the second part was finding those mentors and kind of getting them into the marketplace. And so in the end, I actually just had to do, let's call it sales for one side of the marketplace, which was attract really good mentors. And I put a lot of energy and time and, and writing and DMs into that. Um, but then I was essentially able to bring those two sides together. I was able to do a lot of sweat uh, and DMing to get the mentors in. But then I also had a community behind me who wanted those mentors. Uh, and so my job was just bring those two together. Uh, that, that, that makes perfect sense. And thank you for sharing this kind of perspective shift. Because to me, marketplaces are hard because I am one of these technical people. You know, right. like I come from a very technical background. And whenever I, I did try to bootstrap a marketplace with other people in the past, like a, a local food marketplace back in my days in Berlin in like 2015 or something. And it didn't work because we were so focused on the features on the technical side, but very little focused on the community and or like the vetting the sales process. It's funny that what comes so easy to you came so incredibly hard to me, which, uh, you know, it's nice to see this shifted to another perspective. And it, it kind of makes my, my next question almost answer itself, I guess. But so how do you prevent yourself from building too many features in the marketplace? I guess the answer is you just don't care as much about that stuff. <laughs> or, but, well, that's, that's kind of what I want to know. Like, do you have a certain scope of features that once you, you have them, you're done with it and the rest is just like putting people power into the business? You know, I wouldn't say so. Um, I would say, you know, Mentor Cruise right now, I would call it feature complete, you could say. Like it's a perfectly fine marketplace where you can book mentors, um, where you can have like a little chat, a little dashboard there, a couple of billing tools. I think that's quite important. Um, and, you know, from that side, now we could go 100% on getting on new new users and the thing would scale to some degree. Um, that doesn't mean that Metro Cruise doesn't change. I think as we, for example, changed markets, I think we had to adapt a couple of things. You know, before it was like this thing where you would almost do pro bono mentorship for like self-teaching students. And nowadays it's like this thing where you can almost put together coaching packages and it's like it's becoming much more serious. And so that also needed more features in there. But I would say it's more feature light. Um, to give you an idea, we're, we're five people right now. Um, I'm actually the only one writing code, and I do it about two days per week, maybe not even because, you know, there's emails and other stuff. So um, we get we get by by doing maybe like 10 hours of coding per week as a company. 
Um, I'm not sure, you know, what other SaaS companies can say that about themselves because obviously you need to build those features. You need to work with those customers and their requirements. That's not so much the case for us. For us, it's important that, you know, the people that we have on the marketplace are really good, that we do moderation, that we, you know, more so build out systems that help people mentoring and coaching rather than, you know, features that you can use on the, on the platform. Yeah, that, that kind of thought that makes perfect sense to me. Like the systems to, that you put in place, they're immediately usable by everybody else. And the feature yeah. might be something a couple people might use, might need even, but just a couple of them. I think that, that to me is a priority thing, right? The, if you prioritize the, the systems, it has a, a massive impact. How much time do you spend generally on operating, like talking to your customers, talking to the mentors or the students any given day? Um, at any given day, I would probably say two to three hours. Um, that's usually kind of my morning job, which is to, to go through emails, um, to go through our Slack channel, which is full of mentors. So every mentor is on our Slack channel. It's like a pretty busy, uh, place to be in there. Um, I also have actually a couple of systems that help me reach out to more mentees and just like get into conversations with them. So, you know, here and there, there might be a call, um, to kind of see how they're doing, maybe to work on something together, like a case study or a blog. Um, so I, I try to, you know, do that first thing in the morning, like answer emails, uh, go through messages, Slack channels and so on. And what happens then is basically it leaves me with however long I want to work, let's say five, six hours, but maybe sometimes less for, you know, deep work, be it, um, doing something with marketing, um, be it looking at a product, seeing what does it need kind of for the next step? What's the next thing that we work on? Or then, you know, on a couple of the days actually going in and coding something. Wow. That, that is, so it's kind of a nine to five at this point, or is is it more or less than that? That's always what I'm interested in with that particular kind of business. I would say it's more than a nine to five, but it has an immense amount of freedom. So in the sense that I can basically say whenever I want to to work, um, I'm able to to travel and work. I'm able to maybe take lunch time off and go to the gym for two hours. Um, you know. Essentially, it's a, it's a very free business. I try to have very little calls in that business, kind of in the very typical um, bootstrapper slash lifestyle business lifestyle. Um, so basically, just have a lot of self governance over what I do. But in the end, yeah, I end up putting a lot of time into this. Um, but it's generally a lot of fun. And if I didn't want to put a lot of time into it, after those two three hours of emails, I might just like shut off my computer and do something else as well. Nice. Yeah, that's. I, I think I, I just recently read a tweet by by Dagobert Renouf, and he was talking about the difference between freedom and autonomy for for bootstrappers, for founders like us. I think it's an interesting thing to just ponder. Like, do what is freedom for me? Is it just making my own decisions, or does it mean like having all the time in the world? Like, depending on on what you choose, there, it's uh, it it kind of informs what you're going to be doing. And if you work more than other people who have a full time job, but you feel you're more autonomous. It might feel like less work because it's not forced, right? That's yeah, definitely. my own experience too. Um, I think, you know, in this thing, I think startups and bootstrapped or VC funded, whatever, they're, they're hard and you need to put a lot of time into them. Um, and then, you know, when you have that, let's call it freedom or autonomy um, to decide what you want to do and, you know, work on something that you find truly rewarding. Um, but then also, you know, have that control over your time and, you know, have a lot of things that you can do, but not a lot of things that you really have to do. Um, I think it's, it's really rewarding and it also helps protect you from things like burnout. Because, you know, if I have a stressful week um, on the Friday, I might say, hey, you know what, I think I'm going to work the morning and then I'm going to take the afternoon off um, and I don't need to, to ask my boss about it. I don't need to, like, just push a lot of work onto my Mondays or on the weekends. Um, it's a business I've designed to basically say, hey, I can take time off and nobody's going to miss me, essentially. Oh, that's great. Is, is that something that you also extend to your, your employees or the people you work with? Is this kind of freedom? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, we're fully remote, so I don't have anyone here where I live in Zurich. Um, we're also async, so I don't really care when people are online. I'm not tracking their working hours. Um, I just want us to do a good job. Um, I'm setting goals. I'm, I'm meeting with them uh, somewhat infrequently, just that we kind of have time to do what, what we want. Um, so we work you know, for our goals. We work for, for things that we want to get done. I don't care in the end if they work you know, 35, 30 hours, um, 40 hours or, or even more. I think there's maybe a thing where you want to protect people from working too much because yeah. they feel pressure. Um, but yeah, in the same sense, they have the freedom to do the same as I do. 
Cool. Where, where did you find your your uh, the people you work with? Uh, one of the biggest problems that I've had with with my business is just finding the right people, and nobody taught me how to hire. So I'm always interested in other founder stories around that. Yeah, hiring is hard, really hard. Um, and I'm not going to claim that I have a perfect system for it yet. And really, the people when I look at them in in my team, um, they come from you know really various backgrounds. For example, um, my product designer Maggie, shout out to Maggie, um, is someone who actually worked on a case study about Mantra Cruise for her like bootcamp project. Uh, and so she, she reached out to me and said, Hey, I'm working on this case study. Um, I'm just going to send it to you, you know, let me know what you think. And she actually sent it to me in the exact moment I was hiring for a product designer. So I was, I was saying, Hey, you know, just jump into this, this like interview cycle that I'm doing. Let's see how this goes. So, you know, this was just like cold outreach, LinkedIn, really good timing. Um, I hired people before that were part of the Mantra Cruise community, which was cool as well to, you know, have someone that knows the product, uses the product, really loves the product, work on the product as well. Um, and then, you know, there are also the, the typical channels. I think someone we hired from Upwork. Um, there are a couple of like lists of maybe more like vetted freelancers. If you don't want to scour through the whole like Upwork sea of, of freelancers to maybe get something a bit more vetted. Um, but yeah, I mean, they come from, from everywhere and it never gets easier to, to actually hire them. I think I'm, I'm getting better at it now that I've done it a couple of times, but it's hard. Definitely. I think what, what you just pointed out, like, but besides the, the regular kind of upwork stuff, like where you just need people for a particular job, like to be done like very quickly to project based work. The, the thing you describe with finding people inside your community that already are close to the product and not just the product, the founder close to you that understand you that have a relationship with you. That's something I see more and more in kind of founder led creator led businesses like ours, right? Like small ish software businesses or all other kinds of businesses where the creator has a presence online. I see this a lot with YouTubers, like people who build YouTube channels, media businesses, they recruit their editors, the people who help them with captions and the people who help them with like thumbnails and that stuff directly from their audience. Like shout out to Nick who literally is doing the if, if not just the thumbnail maybe even editing this whole thing here today like nice. <laughs> he comes from my own audience because he likes what i did and liked it enough to reach out to me and here we are right so there's there's that that kind of connection that people already have with you that we would be kind of we would be missing something if we didn't tap into that for the recruiting the people that we need that is really cool so that is your internal team but let's let's say as a marketplace like you also have to recruit in the best sense the mentors where do you go there like how do you reach out to people on the i guess supply side of the marketplace yeah. where do you recruit more of them um yeah, so I mean, nowadays, we're really lucky that if you actually type into Google, become a mentor, or become a coach or become a tutor, we're usually there. So I think outbound, we're doing actually zero, we're getting enough people getting in. Um, it's actually very competitive, we leave in, we let in about like 20%, I think, uh, maybe even a little less. Um, and so we really have no shortage of like new and exciting and really great mentors coming in. Um, there might be a situation here and there where actually I'm just personally seeing someone, let's say on, on Twitter slash X uh, or maybe somewhere else. Um, and I'm just saying, hey, you know, why don't you jump in? I think what you're doing is, is really cool. Or maybe they have, you know, shared um, that they want to get into mentoring or coaching. So it would be a nice fit. But yeah, we essentially get a lot of inbound interest um, nowadays. But that wasn't always the case. Yeah. I think the the first, let's say, a hundred mentors have been really hard, and you know that was just manual labor, cold DMing, cold emailing on mass. Um, we never really found a channel where we can get people in at scale because mm -hmm. you need to find like really really experienced people. Yeah. You, they need to have like some kind of knack for for mentoring as well. So maybe have done it in their day job before, or at least they kind of know what things are about. Um, and then, yeah, they also need to kind of have the quality and, you know, the, the social proof. And as you say before, the trust, mm -hmm. um, to essentially that we can throw them onto our marketplace and people will actually book them, which is another big topic. So, um, fortunately nowadays the supply side is going really well for us. Um, but yeah, in the beginning it was manual outreach, just probably north of 2000 messages wow. to get the first hundred people or so. Yeah. Crazy. And uh, I think work for me. I think you got me on the platform like that. <laughs> might be, might be. Yeah. <laughs> you were probably one of the candidates where I was just like, it would be so cool to have Arvid <laughs> on this marketplace. And then, you know, to my surprise, you said actually, yes, uh, yeah. which was great. Yeah. I, I felt like this is a wonderful project and I already had 
it kind of it was at a point in in my journey where I had started just to write. I had my blog, and I don't think I even had the podcast at this point. But I was just trying to teach. So I thought, hey, this might be a great opportunity to teach, not at scale as it is on the blog, but to teach like individually and be part of somebody else's journey. That's something I think in in many ways you impacted pretty heavily uh, my my shift towards building in public with the platform. Like something that is now a very, very potent thing in my life, right? I'm wearing the t-shirt as we speak. Like building in public is a theme that I've, I've dug myself into even more, writing a book about it and all that. Mostly because of the couple of people, I think I, I mentored like five or six people around that time when I started that, and I saw those journeys. And one of, of my mentees on your platform, let me just tell you how amazing the platform is. Okay. Let me just do this because the people I met there were, were so cool. Like all of them very different. And it was really interesting to see just how diverse founders can be in their many ways. Uh, one of the people I met there was a French guy. Um, who, uh, shout out to, to the French founders. We, we had this, this topic in, in the lead up conversation to, to, to this chat. Um, who was just traveling the world in an RV pretty much, like building a software business while on the road. It was really fun just to be part, literally part of his journey, right? With the business that he was building and how he was touring through Europe at that point. At some point, he even sent me some, I think it was some marmalade from France, like, because like, you know, the kind of connection that you have built with people over long times, just a, a Christmas present came out of that. It was really, really fun. So that's, uh, that's the, Conrad was his name. The, that's the, the kind of connection that you have if you build a relationship with people on that platform. And I'm really grateful that I, that I had an opportunity back in the day. I should really get back to it. Let me just say this. Oh, I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but which, um, that, that brings me to, to my next thing. It was interesting because, you know, as a, as a teacher on, on Twitter, you're pretty much giving stuff away for free. So it was a mindset shift for me to charge money for a mentorship. And you, you already kind of debunked the myth that paid mentorship doesn't work because it literally does. I've seen it and it works for both parties involved. How involved are you with setting prices and like helping people figuring this out? Well, or maybe, maybe over time, did that change? Did you start helping people and now it's less or how does it work? Yeah, um, I think at the beginning, I was very hands on, I basically gave like certain limits, I think maybe at the beginning, we even had certain preset prices. Um, and so, yeah, at, at the beginning, very involved. And also, maybe because of that initial feedback that I got that paid mentorship wouldn't work out. I was really kind of micromanaging the side of that. So we actually had an aspect, we still have an aspect of free mentorship. Um, Back then, it was actually just free mentorship. You could, you know, if someone wanted to mentor for free, they could come in and, and get the mentorship. Uh, nowadays, we do it through charity. So you actually have to pay, a th I'm going to say $20 per month, but it goes to charity um, just as some sort of like quality filter. Um, and then I think we had a plan um, that for some reason that I really can't explain nowadays was weekly billing for like one call. Uh, I'm gonna say for fifty dollars or something, and I just said this is this is the the, the price that we have. This is the, the thing that we do. Um, and then over time, you know, I had people join in that were maybe even like coaching and mentoring for for a lot of years, and they were basically saying, "Hey, this doesn't work for me. I actually charge five hundred dollars for my calls because I really think with like twenty twenty five years of experience, this is the value that I can bring." And this is something that like blew my mind, right? Um, and then I think at some point, probably not too far away from uh, when you joined, we actually switched to, well, for one monthly billing, uh, which I think makes a lot more sense. And then you were able to set up these like packages. So it wasn't just a call for $50. It was packages that you were able to put together. And I think we just gave like a pricing range, uh, which probably was quite low at that time. I'm going to say put it somewhere between zero and two or $300. Um, and this is kind of what you can do. And so nowadays we're a lot more relaxed with it. We still have certain guidelines also because there's a certain risk factors for us in there. You know, if someone comes in and they charge $10,000 for one call, call and then we get a charge back and it might be like messy with marketplace and so on and money needs to go different places and so on, we might end up with like a pretty big bill ourselves. 
Um, but I think people can come in, they have a certain limit, let's say, you know, $300 per month. Some people, for some people, it's enough to do like a weekly call for that price. For other people that have a lot more experience and a higher hourly rate, it's maybe just one call. Um, and then you can basically scale up from there. And, you know, nowadays we see mentorships that go up all the way to like $1,500 per month. Um, for let's say maybe two weekly calls or maybe even just one weekly call with just someone where you are 100% sure that they're able to propel your career or business forward. That's yeah, that's quite the range. I, I think I remember there being a ceiling of like 200 ish, 250 or something at that time yeah. too. And it was like, wow, I could never charge this much <laughs> back right. in the day. And now it's like, yeah, it's probably what I would charge per hour at least at this point as well. Cause for my own <laughs> consulting experience. Yeah, and, that's a progression. So definitely. it's, it's nice to see that you've, that you've grown and that you both, and you had to be exposed to the people that brought this value to be able to offer definitely. it to the platform. Right. I mean, I would, I was the same way as you right because i was thinking about mentorship that i was kind of know that that i knew from let's say coding boot camps yeah. where people were almost like volunteers i'm gonna say maybe like paid volunteers um but they didn't make a ton of money from this kind of stuff and so yeah mentor cruise is almost pro bono like you you wouldn't spend a ton of money on on mentor cruise you would also wouldn't make a lot of money um and then just having these people come in that say you know i've I've been a UX designer for every large company on this world for the last 25 years. I'm not going to charge less than $500 for a call with me. Um, yeah, it was, was wide opening, uh, eye opening. And, um, yeah, just, I guess had to happen over time to be exposed to these new things. Um, and also as a marketplace, I guess you're all almost always in the crossfire of two different sites where obviously then the mentees come in. And, you know, the mentees at the time were still mostly like students and that kind of stuff. And then they were saying, why is this guy charging $500 per month? I would never be able to afford that. But then over time, that side matured as well. And now we have, you know, let's say a VP of engineering of a public company getting mentorship from a CTO of a public company. And obviously the prices there are much, much higher. Interesting. Is, is that on the demand side now? Is that something that you actively put like money into in terms of like advertising or marketing or how do you source now those higher quality mentees at this point um i think it it happened over time as we also raised our prices i think it just changes the perception of mentor cruise as well now it's not like a little hacker site where you can you know get a coding mentor for 40 50 bucks now it's like one of the largest open coaching marketplaces where there's something for everyone. Like you might be able to get like a coding tutor and maybe they're only charging like a hundred dollars, but we actually have like people that are pretty high up at Google that are overseeing stuff like Gmail as a whole, um, you know, available on mentor cruise to get booked. And obviously they're going to charge higher prices, but they're also going to attract, um, basically like higher up people or more experienced people um, with the, the budget to basically get that kind of coaching as well. Is that something that you help them with? Like, is there any tooling that you provide for people to like make themselves louder and make themselves be heard more by the people that they want to attract? Um, not so much. I mean, a lot of the people that are coming in, they already have a vast network, um, you know, kind of the same, I'm going to say the same audience that maybe you were in, um, because you're, you're maybe wanting to try something new, maybe want to get into teaching, um, but you're actually a very accomplished professional uh, yourself. And so you have the network to basically get a couple of people in already. Um, and then as, as far as the marketplace goes itself, you know, we attract people through various sources and, and marketing channels. Paid is, is a pretty new one, actually, for you know the last four years, we've done organic marketing almost 100%. Um, and then it's just basically our job to place them in the right places and get them exposure um, that's relevant. You know, if someone's looking for like beginner UX help, it's really not in our interest to show them the UX lead at Google um, that's charging $500 per call. But if you're coming in and you're already a UX design leadership person, for example, um, that might be more relevant. So it's more about, yeah, attracting a vast, vast variety of people, actually, but showing them the right people that are a match for them. In a, in a marketplace like this, what kind of metrics do you track? Like when we, we were initially talking about like churn and retention and, and the words in German that we both don't really know. So, <laughs> you know, because we're exposed to English all the time. What, what kind of metrics do you track like in a people based business? Yeah, I mean, there's a ton um, and there's a, a large overlap with SaaS as well. So just like a SaaS, for example, we also track churn and retention, especially as we are 
a subscription based or a lot of our prices are subscription based. That's very relevant for us as well. Um, would also be relevant, you know, there's a, a really interesting case study about Airbnb where they also track uh, retention and churn, even though there's no subscription, because they estimate that people book one vacation per year uh, with Airbnb. And so their retention is basically one one booking per year. Uh, and so we have that aspect as well uh, for the, the non-subscription businesses. But then we have a lot of metrics that wouldn't make any sense in, in SaaS. Uh, one that I really like is time to first sale, which is basically how long does it take for a mentor uh, that joins Mentor Cruise to get their first mentee? Uh, and that's like a really crucial metric because it basically means like how balanced is our marketplace? Uh, if you come in, you have no, I'm going to say social proof on the marketplace. You have no reviews. Um, and so on. You don't have any history. Maybe you're not charging the, the big box yet. You don't have your profile optimized. How long does it really take you to get that first mentee to basically get started on the, the platform? Um, and yeah, I mean, there's there's a, a very large variety of, of other metrics. Uh, instead of just MRR revenue, you then track GMV, basically how much money is going through the whole marketplace, not only the, the cut that you're taking, but kind of what's happening elsewhere. Um, you have liquidity. So how much of you or how many of our mentors currently work with a mentee? How much of our supply is actually unused right now? Um, you have the demand to supply ratio, which basically means like, are we scaling both sides at the same time? Or is maybe the amount of mentors outgrowing the amount of mentees that we can get in? And if that's so, should we like increase our marketing for the mentee side to basically balance all of that out again? So yeah, it's definitely a, a bit of a science as well. Um, and what I would say is a bit different from SaaS as well is that there's just way, way, way less resource about it, which makes sense. Um, I think, you know, SaaS is really like booming right now. But when you compare it with marketplaces, you really need to kind of search for that kind of stuff. And the tooling is is much less mature than in the SaaS world. Very interesting. Were you ever tempted to, you know, build a business around that or even just write a book about this topic? You know, we have like an internal analytics board that I would love to maybe make available at one point. But then we come back to the, you know, should you have side project next to your job? <laughs> and I was already telling you that this thing is more than a nine to five. Right. So um, it's probably not going to happen in the near future. But definitely, I think it's it's a market gap. Um, and, you know, maybe if whatever happens and I don't need to spend as much time anymore, I would maybe also be inclined to kind of help marketplaces as a business model. Um yeah, grow to the level or close to the level that SaaS is right now. Yeah, you could be a mentor around this topic. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I think it's my number one or number two tag on Mentor Cruise, actually. Oh, so <laughs> that's that's cool. That's interesting to know. I, I'm I, I think I'm with you. I think marketplace tooling, uh, as we tried to build it back in 2015, was non-existent. We had to build the whole thing ourselves. I think even back then, uh, Stripe Marketplace, like their internal, you know, like connect your account to Stripe and charge through and get get like this pass through kind of uh, compensation going was in its infancy and i think it's more mature now I, i'm still wondering is it is it complicated to integrate this i'm, I'm asking this both like as a, a business operator and a technical founder at this point like how is dealing with that particular platform and have you ever like found another platform that could even rival this because i'm always looking at alternatives right you want to minimize platform risk with this kind of stuff like how is the stripe marketplace happening for you I mean, the Stripe marketplace is amazing. Um, and I know that in SaaS, maybe Stripe isn't the, the kind of number one king or queen anymore. But I think in marketplaces, definitely, um, there's there's like nothing that gets close to it, mostly because with Stripe, you get the end to end experience, right? Like you get the checkout where you add your credit card and whatever, and then you can basically just write I mean, really, it's like five lines of code to say, hey, I want to get 20% of that and 80% of that get, get, go to the, the mentor or the supplier. Um, so that's pretty great. All the other tools in the market, what they're basically doing is send us a bunch of money and we'll do the job of like distributing it. But that still, um, that still involves you like collecting the money, usually through Stripe again, or maybe then you can go with like an MOR or whatever um, and then pay it out. And what's quite interesting is then legally speaking and in terms of like bookkeeping and accountants, it becomes a thousand times more complex as soon as you touch that money, because then you're the, the merchant of record, right? Then you're, then you're liable for that money coming in. With Stripe, that's not the case because I never see that money. I just get a, a, basically a fee, just like Stripe gets their like three, 4% fee. I get my 10, 15, 20% fee. 
Um, and I, you know, just see that part of the money and that just makes it much, much easier, cheaper and less stressful to build a marketplace business. That is good to know because I, I, I was wondering how complicated this is. And it sounds like you, you found your stride. You found a way to, you know, automate all these things using a platform that has just this one cohesive process. Um, as you are in, in the middle of Europe, I probably slapped up in the middle of, of that continent. You're probably yeah. surrounded by a lot of people who have to deal with a lot of taxes and a lot of those kind of things, right? Definitely. How, how is that with that platform? Stripe has kind of been notorious about making taxes an afterthought in the past. Is that something that even touches you or is that for every mentor to figure out for themselves? So fun story, actually. Um, in Switzerland, the good thing is um, you can do a business quite easily, at least when you're like a sole proprietor, you don't have an LLC or something. It's very easy to start a business. And then the limits to actually become a, a real business are quite high, 100K per year. By that time, you know, you have a bit of funds, a bit of leverage to to hire people to do this for you. But the thing with Europe is, is that I think we don't have as much exposure to these new kinds of businesses. And so when I hit those 100K per year with Mentor Cruise initially, I started going to bookkeepers and accountants, basically asking them, hey, what do I need to do here? And I think I ended up taking four consultant or like intro calls and I got four different answers, um, especially around like the marketplace thing, right? Like what do I need to pay VAT on? What are the taxes on this stuff? And nobody were, was able to give me an answer. I got anything from, you don't need to pay any VAT because, um, you know, it's just like f fees that you're collecting up to, you actually need to pay VAT on the whole transaction, not just like your little cut that you're getting, which would have like turned our profits to zero, right? And so one thing that I've done, which I'm actually ending up talking on every podcast with a German for some reason is I moved the business to the US. Um, so Mentor Cruise is Mentor Cruise Inc. right now. It's in Wyoming. I used the service like a lot of the other services. And very quickly, uh, we went from I need to go to 10 accountants and pay quite a bit of money to basically get no answer to a new bookkeeper that is able to tell me, yeah, just send me your Stripe report. Super easy. Just send me like this PDF from your Stripe and I'm going to do everything for you. So uh, I think that was a good step. So I, I wouldn't wouldn't be able to tell you much about how it is right now to like run a business in Switzerland because legally I'm just an employee um, that happens to be employed at a U.S. company. Um, more I don't do anymore with with Switzerland actually. That's that's a great answer. That's also something I did for a Permanent Link, my my little SaaS business that I run, which is also in Wyoming, in Sheridan, Wyoming. That's that's where. Yeah, it's Sheridan, like. Wyoming. I know the the zip code and everything. <laughs> I think we might have the the same post box, like the post. I think we actually Probably. might have the, used the same uh, platform for this, which is cool, right? How easy that yeah. is, how cheap it was, and how quickly it went. And I have the same yeah. experience with my bookkeeper. There is like, yeah, send me whatever, and you just sent them right. like random <laughs> do emails and, and documents that. Like, oh sure, here's here's your final thing. We're gonna send it in for you. Just pay us a couple hundred bucks. Same experience and same other experience in Germany here when we had Feedback Panda and we were getting into the you know like 30, 40 k monthly recurring revenue um, in, in in US dollars. Uh, we went to tax advisors trying to figure out how we're gonna do this. And the first guy we met was like, well, yeah, you print out all the invoices. <laughs> which at, at this point we had like 2000 customers monthly. So we would have had to print like a stack of paper, at least this high. And then we're going to deal with that, which was not now we're going to find somebody else. And we eventually found somebody who would take an email with uh, an Excel sheet with all the invoices that I had to build a feature in the platform for that would give them the Excel sheet in the exact right way. Cause they couldn't do it. Otherwise it was horrible. Like had I known it back then, I probably would have started uh, a Wyoming or Delaware company as well. Yeah. I mean, we now get into this issue where we work with a lot of, of mentors and a lot of them, you know, they don't do anything like freelancing. They, they don't run a company. Um, and so in order to start mentoring, essentially, they need to have at least like some minimal setup to get a Stripe account, right? Um, and that's no issue at all. Like you can put sole proprietorship. You can make however much money uh, without any issues, except for in Germany. Uh, and we actually have a little self-help group in our Slack channel just for <laughs> mentors in Germany oh um, because generally they can't come on the platform and earn $100 per month without getting into a whole lot of trouble with papers and whatever. Um, so yeah, it's it's a huge issue. I would love that if it was a bit easier. 
Um, I think, you know, some of the other European, European countries are making strides with that where you can't just come in, put in your like social security number essentially and then get taxed as a freelancer on this kind of mentoring stuff. Uh, and then as you mentioned, Stripe also has a Stripe tax integration now. So, you know, that gets a little bit easier for, for kind of them as a freelancer as well. But Germany remains like one of the <laughs> really difficult places to even earn 1k per year it's, with mentoring it's, definitely it's a bizarre place like it has such convoluted tax law and and uh, the system that exists isn't just a law it's also like this layer of people dealing with the law tax advisors bookkeepers and all that that make it equally complicated because they are involved in everything notaries right if you want to start a company in germany and i don't want to turn this into like a diss of the the german <laughs> business system but i've went through it as well like you if you want even if you want to start one of these these kind of small um limited companies the the one euro company there right you still have to notarize it and you still have to go into a place where somebody is sitting in an office reading you a document and you have to give them money for those 40 minutes that they literally just read the thing you could have read in two it's it's really really horrible and and in many ways keeping people from doing this is switzerland much better like how, how many indie founders do you know in, in switzerland that uh, enjoy working there with a with a swiss company yeah i mean i would say it might be a little better than than germany but it's not great and you know indie founders that i've met irl you know, because it's a small country, I should really be able to meet everyone. IRL is less than my 10 fingers, <laughs> right? Um, so I met a couple of, of lovely um, people here that, you know, run their own indie business and so on, but it, it's not a lot. There's definitely not like a thriving community around uh, indie businesses here. And I think it ends up being like a couple of different things in Switzerland that come at play. One is it's an extremely, extremely expensive place, right? Uh, you need to if you wanted to do this thing, you need to be able to get to a revenue of, I'm going to say, if you live in Zurich, you probably need a revenue of like 8K MRR to after costs and taxes and whatever, just survive out here. Maybe you can like go super ramen profitable and just like <laughs> in a small room and just eat ramen. Uh, then you might wow. go down to like 5K <laughs> MRR, you know. <laughs> Crazy. It's, so, in some countries that would be $500, not a, not even yes. that, right? It's bizarre. No. Uh, so, you know, you need to pay for a bunch of stuff. The rents are high. Um, health insurance, you actually need to pay yourself over here. Um, and then I think the other thing is then, the, the counterpart of that is obviously the salaries are super high, right? Like as a software engineer, um, I was able to get out of school. Granted, I took some like weird jobs and, you know, remote jobs and so on. But I basically came out of school making 100K per year, right? And that's like US level of salaries. Um, and so if you have a really easy path, I'm going to say, especially as a software engineer, to make 150, 200K per year, you really need to have a lot of conviction to say, hey, I'm going to quit all of this for my like struggling business that's not even ramen profitable yeah. at 5K MRR for some reason, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. So I think it's just not a really attractive thing to do. And then, you know, culturally, I think it's like the rest of Europe where we probably value security and stability and so on a little bit more over the, the like thrill and freedom or whatever uh, of running a business. Oh, that's funny. How is Mentor Cruise doing financially? Like how much, how much do you share about this and how, how, how is it doing? Yeah, I share, you know, certain milestone numbers here and there. I stopped sharing like actual revenues or like the open pages that I so loved uh, as I started my journey. I don't really do anymore. What I can say is we're somewhere around like 40k MRR, um, which I really like to, to be in. I think we're growing every month, which I also really like. And then, you know, probably the best part of this is like we're actually very profitable to the point where we can um, put a lot of the money that we don't spend on, on people and operation costs and so on into marketing, paid marketing, but as well as marketing freelancers, getting in a couple of experts to help out. Um, I think this is a really kind of joyful part or joyful time to be uh, building this because, yeah, there's just a bit of like money and leverage around where I can hire like really experts, not only to like fix the business and maybe like get it to the next step, but also to learn a lot, just like getting experts in, uh, and showing them, showing me what I can do, showing what other things we can do for the business, brainstorming, uh, and yeah, growing the business more and more. That sounds really cool. That that is a wonderful journey to be on. And 40k ish and and growing. That's solid. That's awesome for a team of five. 
and uh, somebody who eats very expensive ramen, that's a pretty, pretty solid right. number. <laughs> love it. Love to see it. Um, I'm, I'm always super happy to, to see what you share about this business because like I said in the beginning, it's not just that it's a cool, software business that you're building it's also like a vehicle for learning and it's a vehicle for people to make money for people to learn how to make money it's it's like the mix of all the things that i love so i'm i'm really really glad that you're sharing so much about it thank you so much for for sharing all these insights if people want to follow you and want to see you building this this amazing platform in the in the future where should they go so best place to to follow my journey is twitter x uh it's at dqmon um, you can, you know, you can tell me and DMs me what you think the Q stands for. Um, then I'm also on, on Mentor Cruise. If you actually want to book me for a call, my short link is mentors.to slash Dom. If you want to go to my, my profile directly. And then I'm here and there on LinkedIn a little bit as well, just kind of under my name, but really the best place to go is Twitter slash X. This, yeah, who, who knows what it's called, really? I don't know. Yeah. Like to me, to me, it's always going to be Twitter. I, th I think I'm growing old. I think I'm going to stick with Twitter or <laughs> yeah. Twitter slash X is kind of funny to say it, as well. It's, yeah. it's, it's worse than X, but it's not better than, than Twitter, right? right? So, you yeah. know, <laughs> it's a very easy choice. Hey, man, thanks, Tom, so much for, for all of these things that you shared about your platform. I think. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah. Man, obviously, it's, it's taken a couple of years to get to this, but it's, it's such a pleasure to talk to you. I think you, you will have inspired several people to become mentors today you probably also have inspired many people to try and build a marketplace in their field because what that's amazing the way yeah. you, you shared it sounds like it's a it's a pretty feasible thing so thank you so much and and that was really really nice thank you so much for having me and that's it for today i will now briefly thank my sponsor acquire.com imagine this you're a founder who's built a really solid SaaS product. You acquired all those customers and everything is generating really consistent monthly recurring revenue. That's the dream of every SaaS founder, right? Problem is you're not growing for whatever reason. Maybe it's lack of skill or lack of focus or apply in lack of interest. You don't know. You just feel stuck in your business with your business. What should you do? Well, the story that I would like to hear is that you buckled down, you reignited the fire, and you started working on the business, not just in the business. And all those things you did, like audience building and marketing and sales and outreach, they really helped you to go down this road, six months down the road, making all that money. You tripled your revenue and you have this hyper successful business. That is the dream. The reality, unfortunately, is not as simple as this. And the situation that you might find yourself in is looking different for every single founder who's facing this crossroad. This problem is common, but it looks different every time. But what doesn't look different every time is the story that here just ends up being one of inaction and stagnation because the business becomes less and less valuable over time and then eventually completely worthless if you don't do anything. So if you find yourself here, already at this point, or you think your story is likely headed down a similar road, I would consider a third option, and that is selling your business on acquire.com. Because you capitalizing on the value of your time today is a pretty smart move. It's certainly better than not doing anything. And acquire.com is free to list. They've helped hundreds of founders already. Just go check it out at try.acquire.com slash Arvid, me, and see for yourself if this is the right option for you, your business at this time. You might just want to wait a bit and see if it works out half a year from now or a year from now, just check it out. It's always good to be in the know. Thank you for listening to the Bootstrap Founder today. I really appreciate that. You can find me on Twitter at Avid Kahl, A R V A D K A H L, and you find my books and my Twitter course there too. If you want to support me and this show, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, get the podcast in your podcast player of choice, whatever that might be. Do let me know. It would be interesting to see. And leave a rating and a review by going to ratethispodcast.com slash founder. It really makes a big difference if you show up there because then this podcast shows up in other people's feeds. And that's, I think, where we all would like it to be, just helping other people learn and see and understand new things. Any of this will help the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful day and bye-bye.